Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. In uh, the, the previous video, we I tried to give somewhat of a bird's eye overview, uh, a look at the chapter. So we're going to begin in this in this video here. I think this is part 31. We're going to start going verse by verse and looking at this in more detail. I want to thank you very much, uh, all of you who are continue to participate with us in this wonderful study through this epistle. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for your love that you have for us, that you died in our place, that you came to, to give us life and that more abundantly. I just asked ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, uh, ignorant, uh, not of you, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, because we desire to grow in grace and knowledge of you. In this I pray in Christ's name, amen. Now as touching things offered unto idols, now you, you'll remember that uh, when we started uh, chapter 7 concerning marriage, concerning the, the things whereof you wrote unto me, and the, and the word says Paul, and, and the word uh, things is plural. And I tried to point out what some of them were in chapter 7. Uh, we dealt with marriage, we dealt with divorce, we dealt with uh, virgins, and so on and so forth. And now we're dealing with things touching things, uh, we're d dealing with things touching things offered to idols. So this is one of the plural things that the Holy Spirit is addressing uh, to these believers uh, there at Corinth. Now you almost have to pause and think for a moment. The things that really seem to concern Christians are, are touching things offered to idols. Uh, do you suppose that they're concerned about uh, serving the Lord from a pure heart fervently, uh, trusting Him. You know, we often talk about how much we love and how much we trust the Lord. And then some little thing happens in our life, which is, uh, which uh, to us is a, is a great tragedy or something. And where did the trust go? I mean, are we willing to say, though He slay me, yet will I trust in Him? You have, I have, uh, we have the Lord God who created the heavens and the earth, the majestic Son of God. Uh, uh, there's no power that can be compared with our God. You know, so what difference should it make? What happens? He knows the way that we take. He holds us in the palm of His hand. Uh, we are His child. We're loved from eternity. We are loved by God. And, and I'm not saying that we don't suffer. Of course we do. We learn obedience through the things that we suffer. But the wonderful thing is that if we suffer with Him, which we will, we shall also reign with Him. And those are wonderful truths. You know, as a kid... Uh, you know, I, I, I sort of idolized a, a fake hero that bullets didn't hurt. You know, someone who could do anything, you know, who could leap tall buildings in a single bound, uh, you know, who had supreme strength. I even wanted to be him. You know, I kind of ran around the yard like a chicken, you know, flouting this cape that I made out of a towel. You know, I, I thought Superman was awesome. And we, but folks, we have much more than that. We have the eternal, almighty God who spoke the worlds into existence, and He holds us in His hands. What can touch you that He doesn't allow? You know, it seems almost uh, incidental, you know, to worry about things offered to idols. And yet, that's the way Christians are. They are much more concerned in the main, okay, much more concerned about incidental things than they are serving the Lord from a pure heart fervently. You know, lie not 
one to another, seeing that you put off the, the old man and you put on the new man, walk worthy of, of the vocation wherewith you were called, study to show yourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I mean, you know what God has asked you to do. You know what His will is. And yet we have great concern and disputes over these little things. You know, churches have split over whether you're immersed three times or once in water baptism or whether you're immersed at all. Paul and Barnabas, led by the Lord, wanted to go out and they wanted to spread the good news of the grace of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ who's all-powerful, the all-powerful, majestic God of all creation. Uh, no power compared to the God who, who is our God. And they got all these, these problems. Like storms, uh, beatings, stoning, uh, insults, uh, thrown out of places, uh, persecuted severely. But isn't that the way that we learn to trust Him and to marvel at what He's done? So He leads them around, and they wind up at Antioch, and Antioch looks like a good place. You know, so they establish the, uh, oh, I, you know, the first Bible church of Antioch, and it's going pretty good. You know, Paul takes the morning service, and Barnabas, you know, he, he takes the evening service, and and, uh, and all of a sudden, there are Jews that, that come down there, you know, because this church is, you know, it, uh, uh, this, this church is going verse by verse through the Old Testament scriptures and some of the revelation that God is giving uh, through Paul to complete the Word of God. And that is bothering these Judaizers who are insisting that at least at least you must be circumcised. And then there's some other uh, incidentals of the law that anybody who loves this Lord should, if you really love this Lord, you should obey Him, you should obey all these things. And the, and the dispute became quite heated way back then. So if we look at uh, one side of the coin, the church in Antioch decides, they decide, okay, that they're going to take up a special offering. Maybe they had a, a meal thrown in. I don't know. And they're going to come up with enough money to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to talk to the experts. I mean, after all, the... Uh, the church at Jerusalem is James and John and Peter and 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 these are the guys who were with the Lord for you know three and a, three three and a half four years of his earthly ministry, and what we'll do is is we're going to send Paul, we're going to send Paul and we're going to send Barnabas up there and we're going to have the experts we're going to have them settle this question. So the church got together and sent them up. If we read Acts, now if we go to uh, if we go to Galatians, we get the other side of the coin. Paul and Barnabas went up to Jerusalem by revelation from God. Oh, but wait a minute! I, I thought that they were sent up by the church. Well, I, I, obviously, it depends on on uh, on which view that that you take, uh, which view of God that you know, one takes. They didn't, uh, they didn't primarily go up to Jerusalem to settle the problem at Antioch. They went up to Jerusalem to straighten out John and Peter and James and the, and the church at Jerusalem. Uh, those esteemed to be something what, whatsoever they were formerly makes no difference to me, says Paul. So God sent them up for one purpose. The church 
at Antioch sent them up for another. However, they did consider the things that bothered them at, at Antioch. And so they discussed this with, uh, with the church at Jerusalem. Acts 15.20 uh, Acts 15.20 they decided to write unto the Gentile Christians that they abstained from pollution of idols. And in Acts 15, 28, well, it, it seemed uh, good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Uh, these necessary things. Necessary. That you abstain from meats offered to idols. So, so the Corinthian church had that letter so obviously touching uh, things offered to idols you know what was written to them abstain from meats offered to idols but 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 they they seem to have missed the context the the pollution of idols and and i'll discuss that more uh, um, as we continue on here it it isn't that you uh, ask uh, uh questions about the meat, but you don't go to the idol's temple to, uh, to a feast uh, where you know it's, that it's a feast uh, to the idol, and we'll get into that later, but, but they've taken this one phrase from the letter that they abstain from meats offered to idols. Well, there was a lot of idol worship uh, around. In fact, that was, the, that was the going thing. I mean, just like it is today. Uh, you know, maybe a, a different, different kind of idols, but not a whole lot. People are always more interested in worshiping idols that have no power. You know, they, they can't move. You know, a, a, big, a big stock investment program, uh, it can't move. You know, it couldn't get out of the way of a fire. I mean, it's totally dependent on somebody moving it, handling it, you know, caring for it. It can't even decide whether to sell or buy, but it can be worshipped. But our God is God, so there's a, there's a lot of false worship going around. And... Uh, since you worship this idol, you want to give the best that you can. You want to, you want to give it all that you've got. All right. Christians don't often give the best that they can, but a lot of idol worshipers do. You know, amazing what uh, some people will, uh, will go through for what I think is an idol. Something that they really worship. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to trust in a $10 million investment account than in a God that you can't see. You know, and, and hordes of people do. You know, that which can vanish in an in a instant. But God is eternal. So they brought the best meats when they sacrificed to the idols. And, and there, there was lots of this meat and it went into the, to the, to the grocery store you know, Walmart, you know, Safeway, Piggly Wiggly, you know, whatever, you know. And, and, and you know, they, they had the best meats. Now, do you go into the grocery store and you say, uh, was that meat offered to an idol? You know, and there's all kinds of arguments about this. If you're really a good Christian, then you want to make sure that any meat that you buy, even though it's a lot better looking than, you know, is that, that, that's a whole lot better looking than what I'm seeing over here. You know, you ought to buy that poor meat, you know, the, in the, the kind of the five for 25 discount. I don't know what, what in our store it's, you know, you five for 25, you know, it's a kind of a discount section because that probably wasn't offered to idols, okay? And they, they became very fastidious about this. And so what people at Antioch were doing is saying, well, you ought to make sure when you buy this meat that it wasn't offered to idols. And that isn't what they were told. They were told 
and to avoid the pollution of idolatrous worship that is well that's in the that's in the actual sacrifice or offering of that of that meat in an idolatrous ceremony and we'll look more at that as we go on in fact we'll read it in the 10th chapter you know if any of you that believe uh and somebody that, that, that doesn't believe bids you to a feast and you dispose to go. I suppose you could say led of the Lord to go, but but dispose to go. You know, what's, whatsoever is set before you, eat asking no questions for conscience sake. And that's that's still something that happens today. You know, I don't eat this, I don't eat that, I don't drink this, I don't drink that. However... On the uh, other side, if any man boasts to you that this is in fact something offered, a sacrifice offered unto idols, if they, if they're that's what they brag about, okay, over that, then uh, then don't eat it. Don't eat it for the one who said that to you, for his sake, and for conscience sake. Uh, show that you are the one who really believes in the Lord, but you don't have to ask any questions when the meat's set before you unless there's, well, unless there's some reason given that we are now worshiping that which was sacrificed to an idol. So they had this letter from Jerusalem, you know, from the church experts, you know, who Paul straightened out and they sent this letter, and they're now asking, what about this letter? What about things offered to idols? Things replaces meat, food. There, there were other things that were offered to idols, and you know, all kinds of trinkets and whatever. And apparently we're going to enlarge on this letter we, we got from Jerusalem. To include not only food but other things that might be offered to idols. So they've enlarged on the on the commandment. Okay. They uh, they didn't necessarily have to do that. We know that we we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. The love builds up. That's verse one. We know. Perfect tense. That's that's oida. That's 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 uh, we know. We know. You know, everybody here knows without any question, you know, you knew it before, you know it completely now, that you gain knowledge, gnosko, change of words here, gnosko, experiential knowledge. You gain knowledge through experience. This word is gnosko. Gnosko is the knowledge gained by, by intimate association, by relationship, by experience. Everybody has that, and that kind of knowledge puffs up. You know, the senior in high school, you know, has more experience than the freshman, the sergeant in the army, he's got more experience than the private. And there's uh, always the temptation to lord it over people, you know, to be puffed up. Actually, it usually turns out that if uh, if you're actually, you know, if you're over someone, well, there's someone over you, you know. But it does that. The fact that you have learned intimately through experience, through testing, through intimate association leads to being boastful in your own experiential knowledge. But the love, this is articulated, builds up. Okay? Now the definite article is there. It's not in the English of most translations and I've spent little little time really talking about the definite article and, and I'm no expert on it. I'm no expert on the Greek. I'm no expert on the 
definite article. I've studied it over the years as, as hundreds of thousands of other people have, but it's, it's there for a purpose, okay? All right, the definite article. Now that could be saying that the knowledge you've gained by personal experience and uh, investigation and relationships puffs up, but if you love the brethren, well, that builds up. Okay? Could be saying that. I mean, obviously, you can, uh, you can build up a, a brother who doesn't know as much as you, uh, as you do, who hasn't had all the experiences that you've had, but there's just something a little bit tainted about that interpretation. You know, like when, when you, you uh, like when you have somebody that, that has a serious accident, you know, two legs busted, a shoulder, collar bone broke, a concussion, laying in a hospital bed, and you go in to comfort, you know, them, and you, you say, well, you know, I remember when I had my, my accident, and, uh, I, had, I had two legs busted and, and a collarbone, but I also, also had three ribs smashed and one of them punctured a lung, you know, and, but, but you know, the Lord is faithful and He brought me through it all. That's not very comforting. But I see it all the time. I know you think you're going through a tough time, but man, let me tell you what I've let me tell you what I've gone through. You know, it does. It puffs up, folks. You know, you weathered it. You went through the storm. You made it. You know, pat yourself. Give yourself a good pat on the back there. You made it, and you're going to encourage them by telling them how that you did it. You don't really mean it that way, but that's the way it often comes across. So that kind of knowledge does puff up. But dearly beloved, I do not think the text is saying it's your love of the brethren that builds up or your love for God that builds up. I think it's saying God's love. God's love builds up. I believe the reason it's articulated is because it's a very specific love, God's love for us. You know, Romans 5, God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, He died in our place. In our place. Who pair in the Greek? I just heard a sermon the other day. The, the minute that you believe your sins are forgiven, Christ died for you. How can, how can you do that? He died for me when I was yet a sinner, when I was His enemy, when I wasn't loving Him, I wasn't seeking Him, I was, wasn't living for Him, I was not believing on Him, I wasn't trusting Him, and He died in my place. Anyone who is not serious with the Scriptures refuses to believe that his death is substitutionary. And I don't see how that they do that with this Greek word. Just one Greek word. He died in my place. He died for me. Very personal. He died for me. And I died with Him. I was buried with Him. I was raised with Him. Dearly beloved, think of it. Think of it. That's how much He loved you. That's the love that builds me up. Knowing that God loves me. That's the love that redeemed me. That's the love that is always concerned about me. You're going to say the reason He loves you, you more than me is because of something that you do? Come on. We're right back at this knowledge that puffs up. Every single one of you who are, a, who are a member of God's family are loved in the same way. When we were yet sinners, He died in our place. Ephesians 2.4 But the God who was rich in mercy for His great love 
I like that expression. That what is His love compared to any love that we can comprehend? Right here at the beginning of the first, in the first verse, the first several verses of chapter 8. Even when we were dead in sin, He quickened us together with Him. When, when were you quickened? When Christ rose from the dead. He's not going to rise from the dead every time somebody accepts Christ. You are in Christ before the foundation of the world. Dearly beloved, God is pointing out how much He loves you right here at the beginning of the chapter. Okay. You died with Him on the cross. He's not going to die again. That's the very message of Hebrews. He's not going to die again. He's not. He'd be put to an open shame. I was there when He died. I was, I was buried with Him and I rose with Him. So did you who are in Christ. We were quickened together with Him. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in the love as Christ also loved us and has given Himself for us. He paid the price for your sin debt. I mean, folks, what's a little suffering here? I cannot believe how fast the time goes. It just seems like only an hour ago that I was doing the last video. Our time here, folks, is very short compared to eternity. It's, it's incomprehensibly small. He paid the price for every single one of His own. And with that comes the time of suffering for His sake. But that suffering cannot be compared to what He suffered. It can't be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. And now here we are, here we are, People worried about eating things offered to idols in the marriage relationship, you know, little comprehending what Jesus Christ has done. Keep in mind who, who Paul's writing to here. How can we make light of His sacrifice for us? And people have said to me, I just can't tell you what I've done. Steve, but, I, I, but I've sinned a sin that's so great, I'll never be able to face God. I'll never be able to serve God again. A sin He can't forgive. You know, any sin that you commit has already been forgiven. The sins that you commit next year at this time are already forgiven. They are already forgiven. But Steve, oh Steve, that means I can just go out and I can just, just sin all I want. I mean, you know, well, go ahead. I already sin more than I want. I am so struck by the love of the eternal, majestic God, the creator of, of heaven and earth, that He would even know I existed. You know, just think for a moment of the people who, who don't know that you exist. I'll bet the Pope doesn't know that you exist. You, of course, that probably doesn't bother you too much, but I doubt if the governor of your state knows your name. I doubt if Donald Trump or, or, or Joe Biden knows who you are. Not very many people know you, but God does. I'd, I'd much rather be known by the eternal Almighty God than by the Queen of England or any other person that you could name. He knows me. He chose me in Christ before He ever created the heavens and the earth. And He decreed to die in my place. And I died with Him. And I was buried with Him. And praise God, I rose with Him. And He says that He has forgiven all of our sins. How good are you in the eyes of God? He's, he's perfected forever those whom He's set apart. I mean, what do you want? What do you want? Yeah, well, that's, that sounds good, Steve. But so-and-so over there, he doesn't look perfected forever. 
So what are you saying? You're saying he needs to do what you did? He needs to do something? You, look, you didn't set yourself apart. God did. God has not appointed you to, to wrath, but to rejoice in the salvation that He's ordained for you. I don't believe there is a single one of us that can even enter into the concept of the, of the eternal Almighty God becoming incarnate and dying in our place. Why should we be under the conscious guilt of sin when the Lord Jesus Christ paid the price, the ultimate price, and we stand before Him perfected forever? It bothers me, folks, when seminaries teach that there are classifications of Christians. You know, there's those, there's those, there's the, the spiritual Christians and there are carnal Christians. You know, they're, there's those dedicated, really dedicated Christians. And then there's those ones who are not so dedicated. Folks, a Christian is one who is perfected completely forever in Jesus Christ because of the blood of His cross. Not because of anything that they did. Not because they received, accepted, repented, was baptized, or any, any single thing they did but by the blood of His cross they are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Now let's all get together and sit around and talk about how you know, we, you ought to not be eating this and you ought to not be drinking this and so, so, so on and so forth. <laughs> Folks, the reason we live for Him is because we love Him. And we love Him because He first loved us He loved us and He sent His Son to be the propitiation because of our sins. That's what He was. We love Him because He first loved us. It's not because we love Him that we become new creations in Christ. We love Him because He loves us. It's not that, well, maybe He'll love you if you do this, that, or the other thing. He loves you. He's not up there putting pins in your doll and trying to make you suffer because you're naughty. He loves you. And everything He does, everything that He does is for your good because He loves you. How wonderful to know the God who loves us. This is what God has placed up front in this chapter for us to contemplate on as we continue on through the following verses. What I see here is God's love for us and all that that love embodies, all that it provides, all that it supplies, being expressed, placed in the context of our great concern and disputes over little things, incidental things, dietary things, married things, sexual things, things anything except serving the Lord from a pure heart fervently because He loves us so much. Because He loved us so much and loves, present tense, loves us so much. The argument over all these things, folks, was settled when Christ died in our place. Of course the church at Corinth was carnal, acting carnal. They needed to know that Christ fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law, which was in fact the ultimate expression of God's love for us. Because we would have never kept the law, never been able to, to keep the law perfectly and completely as only He did. I am free to eat all things. But dearly beloved, how loving would it be for me to flaunt my faith to eat all things in your face while you don't have faith to eat all things?
We're going to pause right here. And give ourselves a few a few days at least to think about this and we're going to continue on in our study through first corinthians chapter 8 i love you all i truly do thank you so much for all of your prayers your support until next time this is steve thanks for watching